I now look to Dr. Leroy Chow to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, honorable officers, honorable members, and honorable guests. This House believes that the future is in space. I believe that our future is in space. As you all know, 50 years ago this year, we first landed humans on the surface of the moon. That was a magical time. I grew up during the 1960s. I grew up during the Cold War, during the beginning of the space program, during the space race. And I was eight years old when that happened. And I remember like it was yesterday. I remember watching an old black and white TV set and looking around, there are a few of you who might remember what that was. But I remember watching the scene unfold in the Mission Control Center as Eagle approached the surface of the moon and then actually touched down. That was the big event, a soft landing on the moon with people on board. We all figured after that happened, they were gonna go walk, right? But even as an eight-year-old, I knew that the world had just changed, and even the newsman of the day, Walter Cronkite, was momentarily speechless. Everybody was speechless, just for about a second. We knew that the world had changed, and for the next few years, everybody dreamed a little more, everyone reached a little higher, everyone tried a little harder. It was an incredible time. It inspired me to want to become an astronaut myself and to dare to dream and to dare to realize that dream. Space is a very good investment. In the post-program analysis of Apollo, the most optimistic analysis said it returned 10 to 1 per dollar invested. In the most pessimistic analysis, it was 2 to 1. We, of course, we should and we are spending money on our planet and the life that is on it, but it's a matter of balance. We should not close the door on space. If we do, it would not only be bad, it would be detrimental, it would be disastrous. Anytime a country stops looking outwards and focuses only inwards, it goes into a death spiral. Look at your own British empire. How's that working out for you? <laughs> Are your social problems any better now? All right, let's talk about some numbers. The United States is the largest economy in the world, so let's talk about those numbers. At the height of the Apollo program, the space program consumed a little over 5% of the U.S. budget. For the last three decades, NASA's budget has been less than 1% and really has been floating right around half of 1% of the U.S. budget. And yet we have accomplished so much. Now let's talk about what happens if we eliminate the space program. Okay, let's say we take that money, one half of 1%, and we spend about two orders of magnitude more on that on social programs to take care of people on this earth, to take care of this earth. Let's take that one half of 1% and add it to the bucket. That is its proverbial drop in the ocean. That would make almost no difference whatsoever. And what would you do in the meantime? You would put tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people out of work, and you would, you would eliminate some very hard assets that help take care of this planet, like NASA-operated remote sensing satellites. But it's also a balance of sensible spending on spaceflight. NASA is not the agency it once was. NASA is no longer the agency that brought us to the moon. Large organizations, by their nature, tend to become more bureaucratic and inefficient as they go on and get bigger. Commercial companies are really the exciting part of today, and I think there's great opportunity in partnership. Let's talk about, let's set aside the hype of asteroid mining, of terraforming. Let's talk about what's happening today in commercial space. SpaceX, Elon Musk, has done what aerospace engineers, experts, many friends of mine said was impossible. It's completely disrupted the satellite launch market. Reusing first stage boosters, recovering payload fairings, reusing them, cutting the cost of launching a satellite down to a factor of three. That's amazing. He wants to go colonize Mars. I'm not sure why, but I'm glad he does. <laughs> He's already working on his Starship, his Falcon Super Heavy, that's gonna be 100% reusable. And the thing I've learned about Elon is that he may not make his timelines, in fact, he doesn't make his timelines, but he does that to drive his teams and he eventually gets there. So I firmly believe he will get to Mars 
with or without NASA. Blue Origin, funded by Jeff Bezos, is also following on with rockets that are going to be fully reusable. He wants to build infrastructure in cislunar space. A lot of exciting things happening, nanosats being launched, nano launchers, a lot of startups, a lot of things happening in commercial space. It would be foolish not to support those things. Finally, let's talk about the intangible effects of spaceflight. Okay, intangible effects of like what inspired me to pursue my dreams. After Apollo, of course, we had Space Shuttle, in my opinion, still the most magnificent flying machine and flexible flying machine ever, followed by the International Space Station, the most, most audacious international project, bringing together former Cold War and former World War II enemies into a very visible common civil program that better relations between all those nations. Let's look about at some of the impacts of our space program. Look at some of the unmanned probes to different parts of our solar system. In just in the last few years, the Cassini spacecraft explored Saturn, discovered remarkable things like a hexagonal shaped huge storm raging on the North Pole. It also dove through some water plumes exploding from the depths of the liquid water oceans through the frozen surface of the moon of Enceladus, 50 or 60 miles up into the atmosphere. It flew through that water plume, discovered some basic building blocks of life like methane and hydrogen. Could there be life in those oceans where there's hydrothermal activity just like there is on our own oceans, under our deep depths of our own oceans? Hubble Space Telescope has seen similar activity on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. Most recently, uh, just a couple of years ago, the European Space Agency flew the Rosetta mission to Comet 67P, which was 30 light minutes away when it went into orbit around that comet. It deployed a lander called Philae, went down to the surface, and the most remarkable find Philae had was it detected the presence of an amino acid in the ice of that comet. Of course, amino acids form the basis of DNA, which form the basis of all life as we know it. Very, very recently, just in the last few months, or maybe even the last few weeks, NASA announced that Curiosity had discovered embedded methane in the sedimentary rock billions of years ago, from billions of years ago. Could that have been a byproduct of former life on Mars? And of course, Curiosity also very recently discovered oxygen fluctuations on the surface of Mars in what used to be a lake bed. We can't explain why, we don't know why. Next year, NASA will send another more advanced rover to that area, and I think it has a very good chance of finding hard evidence of either past and or perhaps even current life on Mars. Think about the impact on society, on culture, on religion. Take all this into account, all the benefits of spaceflight, whereas if we eliminate it, we as a world will enter that death spiral. So I believe in space, I believe the future is in space, and this house believes the future is in space. Thank you.